Welcome to our Buy Corona webinar series. Uh, we have a very special treat, a guest from the UK today, Dr. Anshul Sama, that's going to be um, speaking to us about the Snoozeal novel approach to treatment of snoring and mild obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, before we get on with the program, just a little bit of housekeeping. I, I want to send a, a sincere thank you out to all our sponsors not only for um, their help um, in supporting our programs, mostly the in-class programs, but also for everything they do to help keeping the game up and providing good products and good appliances and improving them constantly so that we can do a better and better job for our patients. So thank you to uh, industry in general. Upcoming by Corona webinars, I'll just mention this quickly next week. We have dealing with COVID-19 at home and at the workplace with Dr. Elaine Chin, um, a, a bla trailblazing family physician in Toronto that is uh, really has a unique practice and also is going to be speaking about, from a physician's point of view, how you can have a safe workplace and a same, safe home uh, through this COVID uh, time period going forward. And then the week after that, we have the Circle, which is a monitoring, a remote monitoring device that a patient wears on their finger, which will help us monitor the efficacy of their sleep appliance and whether we're going in the right direction with our calibration. So Jeff Weiscarver is going to be speaking on that on, on June 5th. A little reminder about our dental sleep medicine speakeasies that take place on Wednesday afternoons, just a bunch of dental sleep medicine nerds to get together and want to chat it up. And it runs from three to five. You can come and go as you please. Typically, uh, yesterday we, we ran till after 5.30 and it's not uncommon. Sometimes it runs till six because people just want to keep talking. So it's, it's a place to come to, uh, to talk about something you're passionate on and we have a different topic every week. And so consider checking that out. And I can't have one of these without sending out a heartfelt thank you to all the medical personnel and everyone else on the front lines, not just the medical staff, but the rest of the staff and even in our stores, everybody that's continuing to keep our society running while we're at home trying to flatten the curve. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. A little bit of housekeeping, uh, audio options, you select computer or phone and just follow the instructions. There's a little chat box there where you can put your comments or questions. And then there's a little panel where you can minimize or expand the dashboard by clicking on the arrow. And also you can raise your hand to get the attention of one of the panelists. CE certificates will be emailed out probably in about three days. Uh, so you don't need to email me asking. And um, if you want AGD CE certification, you need to provide me both your AGD number and your dental license number. Okay. So this is a little fun. Okay. This, uh, the Snow Zeal people are going to be providing a free device for you to have access to to try out yourself, but you have to stay to the end of the webinar where Cami Osborne is going to jump on. She's a representative for Canada and will tell you uh, what the rules of this little contest are. A few facts to help set the stage before we get into today's presentation and perhaps it's a value. Approximately a billion people worldwide have obstructive sleep apnea and 85% undiagnosed. We know that CPAP works, lots of evidence of that and it's considered first-line therapy, gold standard therapy in most regions. However, we also know that long-term compliance 50 to 60% at best. And we know that a portion of those people, perhaps even as much as half of them, are only wearing their CPAP partway through the night and then taking it off. Oral appliances, of course, fare much better. Multiple studies show approximately 90% compliance or adherence. Patients tend to stick with their appliance and tend to wear it. However, 
we know that about a third of the time we have residual apnea. Okay, so we can come up with this mean disease alleviation concept and it might make us feel better. It helps to actually explain why a lot of symptoms and a lot of other factors that are even measured objectively, oral appliances fare as well as CPAP. Nevertheless, this residual apnea is a problem for many sleep physicians. So we need to add adjunctive therapies to help us increase or improve the outcomes. Okay? When we look back at snoring itself, and we know the ratio between snores and the percentage of snores that actually have sleep apnea, well, looking at approximately one billion having sleep apnea, can you imagine how many multiples of this actually snore? So when we're talking about the technology you're gonna be learning about today, both with regards to the snorers out there and with regards to its potential utility as an adjunctive therapy to help us with sleep apnea, or even potentially as an adjunctive therapy to help us for those patients that can't comply with wearing a CPAP all night long, perhaps as an adjunctive therapy, it might reduce the pressure required by the CPAP, and then the patient will become more compliant with CPAP. I think there's tremendous potential here. And I've been very excited about it since I first heard about this perhaps a month ago. Okay? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anshul Sam is a surgeon, ENT researcher, professor, and he'll be speaking to us today on the subject. And I'm going to give you the controls now, uh, Dr. Sama. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, just it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to share concepts, discuss. Uh, and also share with you uh, quite a novel concept that we've come up with. Uh, so just as in a way of introduction, I'm a consultant based in Nottingham University Hospital, which is the middle of UK. I've uh, been here for over 20 years and been part of the uh, sleep team. So we have uh, pulmonary physician, maxillofacial surgeons, myself providing collaborative team to assist the management of these patients. Uh, so I've done a lot of surgery over the years, as you can anticipate, to try and help assist uh, opening up the airway, assist these individuals in trying to get the best management for them. Um, over the years, I, like John and uh, other people, there are often frustrations in our ability to manage these people adequately, compliance being one of the key areas. Uh, efficiency of what we achieve is the other and then sometimes the surgical interventions the fall off that occurs over time in that you may get quite improvement in the early phases and then some of that result is lost over time and that made me think more about what are we really doing here for these individuals uh, and what is really the causation of the problem and that's where this concept really comes from so a uh, couple of uh, disclaimers uh, i am a founding member the inventor and the, uh, the, currently the chief medical officer for the SNU uh, Signifier Medical Technologies, which the uh, Snoozil product is one of the range of products that we're coming up with. I also act as a medical advisor to Olympus and do receive sponsorship from for educational work that I do from multiple companies, most importantly Olympus, Medtronic and Stutz. So just to visualize, what are we talking about here? What is what is this concept? The concept is using a transoral device, which is this mouthpiece that you can see, the Y-shaped mouthpiece, to actually use electrical stimulation for neuromuscular changes. Uh, the key factors about this is it is daytime therapy, but there is no nighttime variable here. And it's only 20 minutes a day, and we have adequate evidence, which I'll share with you, to show the efficacy with snoring and changes in mild obstructive sleep apnea. So a key aspect here, why daytime? What we're trying to do is actually change some of the physiology rather than just looking at altering the anatomy. And I'll come back to this concept again and again in, in, the, in the future. So <clears throat> John mentioned that actually, the incidence of obstructive sleep apnea, if anything, is rising. If you look at any of the, the, the study, the Vince Constant study, you see that actually the original incidence of sleep apnea that was identified has shown that it's rapidly increased over the last 20 years. Uh, and a billion, maybe even greater number of people have this condition 
uh, which is predominantly undiagnosed in more than 50% of the people. But it's also worth considering that it's a spectrum of a condition. And we tend to concentrate uh, predominantly in moderate to severe because that undoubtedly has the best correlation with the comorbidities related to high blood pressure, heart attack, strokes, uh, road traffic accidents, etc. What we sometimes fail to um, uh, really look at is the fact that as part of the spectrum, there is also conditions related with upper airway resistance, mild obstructive sleep apnea, and snoring, which is part of the spectrum. And it's quite likely some of these individuals will over time progress to developing worsening conditions and moderate to severe sleep apnea. So sometimes prevention is better than cure. Um, so our product at present shows efficacy in that spectrum of the condition which I'm gonna share with you now. So if we look at what uh, options of therapy are currently, whoops, did my screen go, go off? John, can you still see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes, we can uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I seem to have lost, ah, I've got the There you go, yeah. There you go. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, Beautiful. Technical hiccup. So if you look at the spectrum of mild snoring to obstructive sleep apnea, we have established methods of three treatment which are efficacious. So CPAP is the gold standard, has been for over 30, 40 years. Uh, surgical interventions have developed and now become more standardized and mandible maxillary advancements in oropharyngeal surgery has a definite position in the management of obstructive sleep apnea on the moderate to severe end. And more recently, we've also heard about the hypoglossal nerve implants as a treatment option available. Um, definitely, there is a substantial place for mandibular or oral devices or mandible extension devices, which last from mild to severe depending, but have the greatest efficacy in the moderate uh, area. And that is another uh, effective modality of therapy for these individuals. On the lower end, we have individuals who have simple snoring or upper airway resistance where there's a spectrum and a plethora of therapies. And the fact that no, none of these have a common theme does tend to make you question the efficacy of it. And all of these tend to have limited efficacy related to it. I do want to have a point out one important crucial thing that most, if not all of these devices are anatomical splints. They're essentially opening up the airway during night to try and reduce the incidence of obstruction. With the CPAP, it's a pneumatic split. With the mandible advancement device, it brings the lower jaw and the tongue forward, bringing the opening up the oropharyngeal uh, airway. <clears throat> Surgery probably is the only one that, if you stop using the device, will still continue having some effect. All the others <clears throat> are transient. So whilst you're using them, they're effective, but when you stop using them, they're not effective. So you have to use them for the rest of your life. Now, the reason we have focused on this is that we know from lots of evidence and lots of literature that there is always anatomical characteristics and narrowing that are associated with this condition. And I'll highlight some of them, and I'm not really going to go into detail into these, but an anatomically compromised airway, although is a common pathophysiological process for them in these individuals, it's not always the causation of it. Because you and I and all of us have met a lot of people who may have retroposition mandible, but don't automatically have obstructive sleep apnea. So although these conditions are associated with obstructive sleep apnea, the anatomy is important but it is not the pure causation of this condition. Because if you take a patient with a compromised airway <clears throat> and you lie them down, they don't stop breathing. That airway is still functional when they're lying down, even though anatomically we know it's compromised. So what is really happening? And that's what really is happening is the fact that during transition from being awake to being asleep, there are certain physiological changes that occur. And these changes are what tip people over. These are the normal physiological changes that you can see here. They're, I'm not going to go into too much detail, 
But you can see there's central, central changes that are occurring in the chemical and cortical stimulation. There are peripheral changes with the lung volume and mismatch. <coughs> and then there are local changes in the upper airway that are causing a, an issue with increased degree of obstruction. But even with this, <clears throat> and somebody with a, a mandibular uh, retraction may not automatically get the condition. They manage to up, uh, be able to compensate. On top of these, there are certain other abnormal physiological things that occur, which tip these people over into becoming obstructive sleep apnea patients. And those abnormal things can be either central, which are to do with <clears throat> abnormal arousal thresholds or ventilatory control, uh, or once again, to do with the local airway and its unresponsiveness. So although there are central stimulations occurring, the local airway becomes non-responsive to these, and hence the airway tends to collapse. So the key factor I'm trying to bring home here is that although anatomy is important and a common theme, we need to actually start looking at the physiology that's causing these people to top over into sleep apnea and look at start turning this around to actually help these individuals. <clears throat> we need to start looking at treating the core cause of this condition rather than just the anatomy, which is an associated factor. So, uh, sorry, Dr. Sama, before you continue, um, this might be a, a, a spot where you might want to ask one of the poll questions. I uh, didn't know when you wanted to ask those questions, so I thought I'd interject and ask if this is uh, one of those uh, times, or Absolutely. you have the two, questions that, the two questions that you put out there. So would you like me to post one of them now? I think it'll be really valuable because they, they gives us a proper break, and it'll be valuable to see what people think. Please. Okay, so the one I'm gonna post relates to what you were just talking about. If you folks can um, take a look at this and just post your answer as quickly as you can, then we can get back into the, the good information Dr. Sam is providing us. So the close, the poll is going to close in uh, five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Do we get the results? Yeah, we'll get them right away. Perfect. So you could, perhaps you can speak to that. Do you see them? Uh, I don't right now. Just Interesting. So I'll just tell you, uh, yes. Elaine, can you confirm you can see them on your slides, right? Well, we had I most, what? You, you can see the results of the polls on your slides, right? I can. Okay, good. So I'll just tell you, Dr. Sama, obesity yes. is 15%, the tongue 80%, Large neck circumference, 5%, and drinking alcohol, 0%. Okay, so, sorry, Dr. V? Yes. We have actually a, a comment from a, a fellow called Barry Boston. I don't know if you're familiar with him. It says that it's not a good question, and the answer is none of the above. Okay, so uh, <laughs> when the question and answer period comes around, we'll let Barry uh, share shots, his thoughts on that. Okay, so Dr. Sam, in the meantime... Uh, you heard that the tongue the tongue got eighty percent. So, uh, did you want to speak on this before uh, mo moving on, or? Uh, no, I think that that is very relevant because okay. the tongue is the biggest dilatory muscle in the airway uh, and has uh, undoubtedly contributory effect in uh, probably the eighty plus percentage of individuals where the tongue will have an effect, and that's. The core part of what I'm going to be talking about is the physiology of the tongue function 
and how we can change that. Uh, so it is interesting, and I would probably agree with that. Okay, so you're speaking to the choir, it seems. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so actually it's quite an opportune moment because what you can see here is in the upper airway, when a patient transitions from being awake to asleep, the factors that change in the compromised airway is the muscle tone and the degree of uh, neural stimulation going to the muscles. What you will also see is that if in the genoglossus muscle, when you're awake, the muscle tone is extremely high, which keeps the oropharyngeal airway well patent and open because between the back of the nose and the larynx, the upper airway in humans is not protected circumferentially. It's really reliant on muscle tone to keep it open and the biggest dilatory muscle in the airway being, being the tongue. But when they transition to sleep, there is a drop in the stent stimulation, but the drop in the genoglossus stimulation is proportionally greater than you see in other respiratory uh, uh, factors, such as diaphragm, intercostal muscles, and those other areas that are obviously important for respiration. And that is one of the key factors that contributes to the compromise of the airway in this, in this area. So what we're talking about here is we've got somebody who's got a compromised airway due to dysfunctional of the tongue and its physiology. We're planning to then treat that physiological problem with daytime therapy with a plan to actually changing the function and behavior of the tongue at night so that we can actually look at reversing cause and or cause of this condition so rather than splinting it open we're actually changing the physiology of the tongue behavior now how do we achieve this we achieve this from this device that you already seen which has three components you have the mouthpiece, which you can see in the center in the black, which is in, which has four gray pads. These gray pads are actually conductive silicon, and they are encased in this malleable uh, mouthpiece, which is non-conductive. So when you pass any electrical stimulation through the USB port that you can see at the end, you can only get transmission to these end electrodes. But by the virtue of the fact that the whole mouthpiece is silicon, it gives us three-dimensional flexibility in the X, Y, and Z axis. So it can widen to accommodate the tongue size, and it can also open to accommodate the tongue as well. So as you can see uh, on the left, you simply insert and you place two of these electrodes array above and two below the tongue, which I will show again. But this has no active agent in it. It's simply an electrode array. It's got no battery, no active agent. The brains of the concept lies with this, which is the control unit. And this has a rechargeable battery and a circuitry that will allow to, which will pass certain electrical impulses through the USB port into the mouthpiece to conduct the therapy. This can be driven either through the app, which we have here, which has two functions. It also tracks your sleep, and it has a therapeutic function to drive your device. Or if you're not somebody who likes to use smartphones or app, we do have a remote control, so you can actually control the device remotely in your hand, and you could be watching the television, doing your emails, getting ready for the next day whilst you're doing this 20-minute therapy period. So going back, what is the prescribed therapy? Daytime therapy during a wake state, 20 minutes for six weeks, and that will lead to the desired changes that I'll share with you in a minute. So normally the mouth will be closed, as you can see with the gentleman on the left. You can see in the middle image how the two electrodes will sit above and two electrode array will sit below with a way of stimulating across these electrodes. But here, just with the mouth open, you can see this contraction occurring of the tongue, which is not the same as my functional therapy that you may be aware of. This is a very different frequency and segments of six seconds of therapy at specific frequencies with four seconds of rest, which leads to this kind of physiological change that we're trying to achieve. So you can see 
how that tongue just vibrates due to the electrical stimulation and it's nothing caustic it's not uh, intensive therapy the type of energy we're using here is what you would normally find in your uh, wristwatch so why do we think this something like this should work uh, well there's plenty of evidence there and i could go through some of it but i'm not going to uh, because i'm more uh, uh, want to share the outcomes of what we've achieved with the product rather than the, the foundation. But the key aspects are that there is lots of evidence to show that the area in individuals that are normal versus those who have obstructive sleep apnea behave differently. And most importantly is what's called the pre-critical, the critical pressure for the area to collapse during sleep. And in individuals who have obstructive sleep apnea, the pre-critical can be actually above atmospheric pressure. So they actually tend to collapse at atmospheric pressure and above, whereas normals, individuals who don't snore, will often require negative area pressure to collapse. But what has also been shown that actually if you make this passive upper airway into an active one, you shift the individual down from the uh, higher pre-critical to a lower pre-critical pressures. So by actually making the airway active rather than passive, we can change the behavior and the collapsibility of the airway. More particularly, when we look at the functionality of the tongue, what is the evidence? The functionality of the tongue, uh, some work done here by Athul and Danny Eckhart, which I'm going to share with you, which is quite critical because it relates to some of the results that I'm going to talk about. What is very interesting in these individuals is that they're resting maximal voluntary tongue protrusion. So the tongue force they can generate when they're awake is higher than controls. So it's not that their tongues don't work and they cannot, uh, they generate higher pressures uh, and protrusion forces than controls. But what is also quite important, which is why often sleep apnea is much more prevalent in the second half of the sleep rather than the first is that there is an element of lack of endurance. So if you compare the tongue functionality of OSA versus controls, you find that the controls uh, fatigue a lot quicker than a normal individual's tongue would do. And this is during awake training and it translates into what their tongue behavior would be doing at sleep as well. So there are physiological differences between controls and OSA patients with their tongue functionality. So what we have done is taken well-established technology of neuromuscular electrical stimulation, which has been used for over 25 years in other skeletal areas and rehabilitation aspects, and used that information and knowledge and brought it to this forum of obstructive sleep apnea. So just a, a article here, which is a, a systemic review, with uh, which just summarizes the data. Of what are the metabolic and structural changes that we achieve by using neuromuscular electrical stimulation in skeletal muscle? The key aspects are their muscle fiber type changes, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. So there is an increase or a change in uh, a move towards type one, type two A muscle fiber types. Also, there are changes in enzymatic behavior. So there's more oxidative activity and more glycolytic and reduced glycolytic activity. What, what does this really mean? So if we look at muscle fiber types, they tend to fall into three categories in humans. If you take other animals, they do have other muscle fiber types as well. And we often call them type 1, type 2, or type 2A or B, or we can call them fast twitch or low slow twitch muscles and their functionality varies the key aspect to realize is that type 1 type 2 a muscle fiber types have a high resistance to fatigability whereas type 2 has a much higher propensity to fatigue and it tends to use glycogen as its source of energy versus oxidative behavior so what we are doing is moving the muscle tongue functionality from type 2B to type 2A and type 1 type muscle fibers, which is where the change in the physiology of the airway occurs. 
key aspects here, if just simplistically speaking, is type 1, type 2A are athletes. They are long distance athletes. Whereas type 2B is going to be an individual who's more like a bodybuilder. He's, you know, a strong muscle, lots of force, but not sustainable over long time periods. Now, electrical stimulation is already here in this arena, but I would like to differentiate between what we're doing and what is already on the market at present. So at present, we have the, the hyperglossal nerve stimulator. And the important factor is that this is an invasive procedure. It requires neck surgery, implants in the neck with uh, implants onto the hyperglossal nerve, and then some form of a sensory process, either in the chest, uh, or otherwise to try and control and, and guide this pacemaker in a way. Uh, the other key factor here is that this is, an, again, simply an anatomical splint. You activate this during sleep, and it activates when you have an obstructive event to actually contract the tongue to open up the airway. So it is just another form of an anatomical splint. If you stop using the device, you stop getting the effect and benefit from the stimulation. It only overcomes this obstruction when it occurs. What we're trying to do is provide an optional therapy for people that's non-invasive, affects a larger spectrum of people, and it's a daytime with no nighttime variable which changes the physiology. And I'll show how this physiological effect actually hangs over uh, for several weeks uh, rather than just a day or two. And what we're doing is really changing the behavior of the upper airway, changing the physiology of the upper airway. It's not simply an anatomical splint. So what proof do we have for the claims that I'm making? So this was our first trial, which we did in Germany with Professor Boris Stuck, who's a, a key uh, opinion uh, and has been involved in writing the guidelines for the European uh, Academy as well. Uh, so here we looked at whether we can get any symptomatic change in snoring. That was our first proof of concept study. Uh, we recruited individuals who had an AHI less than 15 so that they, they were not obstructive sleep apnea patient. We did some two weeks of baseline studies on their reported bed partner uh, uh, reported snoring for two weeks and took the average of that. And at the same time, we looked at the ESS and PSQI as sleep quality indicators as well. They had a six-week therapy, and at that stage, they'd had twice daily therapy. Uh, and we recorded these parameters again towards the end of the therapy period, and then advised them to stop the therapy and see what happens to them two weeks subsequently with respect to their bed partner reported uh, snoring. Uh, so this shows the results before and after the therapy uh, and a collabor just the 30 patients data just on a scattergram in a way but each one of these is one individual and you will see that some individuals the sim uh, subjective assessment of snoring drops quite a bit and others there isn't that much change and that is what we would expect because it is highly unlikely that this physiological principle affects all the patients who have this disorder it affects a category of these patients, which is the ones that we're going to have this efficacious effect on. Uh, and overall, in this 30 patient group, we dropped the snoring score from 6.4 to 2.7 for the primary snorers. And the people who had an HI between 5 and 15, it dropped from 6.6 .6 to 3.6. And understandably, the change was statistically significant. But this is obviously subjective data from bed partner reporting, and it's purely aimed at snoring. So from this, what we would then did was a next higher level study. The next level study was really looking at objective evidence of what change are we doing using sleep studies as our predominant parameter. The other thing we learned from that time, and this was our original product that we started with, and you can see this original product has a metal electrode array in it. So you can see the gold. That was essentially a, electrode, a flexible piece to be uh, encased in a non-conductive silicon array. Uh, and what we realized is that this adds a lot of um, uh, strength to the device, but actually can lead to a feeling of tingling because you've got the metal interface with the tongue. Uh, and also some degree of discomfort because these become a little too rigid. So 
we've changed um, from this product to the one that I showed you to make this a completely a, a silicone-based product, so it has a lot more flexibility to reduce these side effects and the lessons we learned from our original product. So the next stage study that we did was really aimed at identifying objective evidence of what change are we really producing. So although we still collect the bed partner visual analog scales, the effort sleepiness score, and the uh, Pittsburgh sleep quality inventory, we actually added two nights of sleep study during the pre-therapy period as our baseline, and we undertook two nights, consecutive nights of sleep study at the end of our therapy period as an evidence to look at the objective change with snoring and the objective change with the respiratory parameters. And this was undertaken by our colleague, Big Kotecha in London, and we have uh, the data I'm presenting right now is over 100 patients with 54 of those having mild obstructive sleep apnea. So what did we find in these individuals? What we found is that if you look at the AHI, and in this group, remember, their AHI goes between 5 and 15, so it's not going to be extremely high because it's an average. The AHI drops by about over 50%. And with it, which is very important, is the ODI, the oxygen desaturation. So by simply training up the tongue during the daytime, we reduce the number of oxygen desaturation obstructive events these are, people are having at nighttime. <clears throat> what is also very important is the change in their subjective score, and most importantly, the effort sleepiness score drops quite notably, probably greater than what would normally be anticipated in this group, especially when they are mild OSA patients, and you're looking at an AHI of 9.7, you may not think these would be very symptomatic patients. Uh, but I think one of the reasons we achieved this is that we have a no nighttime variable. And that does tend to affect people's uh, effort sleepiness score to, to a degree. And if you look at their snoring, and this is the objective evidence related to the percentage of time these individuals were snoring through the night. And what I represent here is the percentage change in that time that they were snoring every night. So nine out of the 902 showed no change. So we would say that uh, we showed some effect in snoring in about 90% of our, our patients. Some of them, as you would expect, this is a normal distribution graph where some people gain a lot of benefit, others gain limited benefit. And the key factors is, on average, we showed about a 54% reduction in the percentage of time those individuals were snoring. And in 70 uh, of the patients, more than 50% reduction in the snoring. So 50% reduction is quite a significant change. Now, we've set our threshold at 40 decibels, which is picking up any kind of snoring noise. It's not just the high-level snoring. This is all snoring that occurs greater than 40 decibels at night. So substantial change, and this is also statistically significant. I'll just share with you what visually it looks like on a sleep study. So you can see here a sleep study of an individual before the therapy, where you have the snoring and body position on a single chart showing the whole night sleep study. And you can see the different body positions that they've been in. But what you also see is the, the volume, the the orange is their snoring sound and the peaks and the troughs. And this is the kind of change that we are getting in the sleep studies on the snoring objective assessments of this snoring. Just an example of the kind of change we're getting. So did the change in the product make any benefit for the patients? So although these are the number of patients who displayed this uh, side effect, it's effectively percentage of patient, considering we've got just over 100 patients. So about 12% of patients, the main symptom they were getting was excessive salvation. And remember, we had something like seven patients who described tingling. Seven out of 30 at that time is now seven out of 100. So we definitely reduced the side effect profile by changing the mouthpiece. Uh, there were a few people who described some sensitivity with, with fillings. Uh, a metallic taste in some, but the key aspect of this is that this stops as soon as you stop the therapy. 
and it's a lot to do with the positioning of the mouthpiece and by simply changing the mouthpiece position you can actually change that what is also quite interesting to see is the temporal change that occurs in this side effect profile so it's a six weeks once daily therapy that we're offering them and you can see that in the first week there's a high degree of side effect profile 12 percent of people describing excessive salivation but by the time they come to week six that is drops to four percent so as you use the device the side effect profile does diminish notably as well so that shows that the product is effective for treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea but how does it really work and for this we'd gone over to Atul, but i'll share with you this before i go to that is this is a slide where we've actually started now monitoring these individuals for longer time periods. So we did sleep studies at the end of the six week therapy time, and then we're repeating their sleep studies at three months and six months. So this is a long term follow up of these individuals. On the left, we're looking at the snoring sound. On the right, we're looking at the mild OSA patients. And we, these numbers are progressively enlarging as we go forward and do more. Uh, long-term follow-up studies. What is very interesting is a large proportion of patients who, after the therapy, stop using the device, sustain the effect for three months. There is no deterioration with the snoring. A small percentage of those individuals start drifting back to the level that they were prior to the therapy once they stop using the therapy. Similarly, for the AHI, we see that there is a, a, a improvement, but there is a higher percentage of drop off with the AHI. So we do recommend some form of maintenance therapy, and we would recommend using the device once daily for individuals who have primary snoring, or once or twice, so once weekly, uh, or once or twice weekly if you have uh, mild obstructive sleep apnea. But Having actually shown that there is clinical efficacy, we also need to prove that this actually does what we're saying it is doing. It is changing the physiology of the tongue, which is why we're achieving this. And uh, Professor Atul Malhotra, who is probably one of the leading lights in uh, literature and, and publications and work in this area, uh, based at uh, UCSD in San Diego, you know, did a mechanistic study for us on 20 patients looking at objective tongue function assessments. Uh, <clears throat> this is just the demographics of these individuals uh, that they studied. None of these patients dropped out of the trial. So we have 100% compliance with the product, with the, with the completion of the trial. The compliance usually, which we can monitor remotely, uh, is usually between 80 to 85%. So you'll find that an individual will miss one in five therapies uh, because we can monitor, uh, because they're using the app, we can monitor when they're using the product. What did we find in this group? So Akil Atul's group used PSG. So polysomnography, inpatient PSG studies before and PSG study after the therapeutic period to assess what's happening. Now, the entry criteria was AHI less than 15, and because the ambulatory sleep study was uh, used at the, at the point of entry, you will find that some of them showed a very different result when they had their PSG. And you can see that some patients actually had AHIs above 15, 40, and, and 50 plus here when they had a formal PSG rather than ambulatory sleep study. But overall, when we looked at these individuals who were who had an AHI above 15, and the responders, they average AHI dropped from 19.7 to 8.4 on PSC assessment. So that shows that the efficacy is also consistent when we look at PSG data. The numbers here are much smaller, and obviously we need much larger numbers to be able to make adequate claims here. But it's interesting that that trend of over just over 50% change is consistent when we look at PSG data as well. I'll just revisit this slide, which we've seen before, which looked at muscle function physiology uh, and assessment. So on the left, we looked at the maximal force that the tongue could generate. And on the right, we looked at the endurance. And they showed uh, with previous data that actually the maximal force is higher in patients who have OSA because they probably have a higher level of neural 
drive to the tongue due to their compromised airway, but their endurance is much worse, and that is notably worse and statistically significant. So if we look at these same parameters in these 20 patients that we did the mechanistic data on, we showed that the tongue endurance in these individuals improved from 21 to 36.9, which was statistically significant. And these are just what happened to these individuals. And as you would expect, there were a few individuals who did not respond, but others who made some really dramatic changes in their tongue endurance before and tongue endurance after the therapy. When we looked at the muscle tongue protrusion force, the maximal protrusion force, there was no change. And that's quite interesting because we're not trying to build muscle builder. We're not trying to increase the protrusion force. We're trying to improve the endurance of the tongue. And remember, we talked about the shifts from type 2B to type 1, 2A, which should improve endurance, but shouldn't possibly change the force that much. So it's interesting that the protrusion force in these group did not change. It was very similar, but the endurance was significantly better. So I think what I'd like to do is just to summarize, what I present to you is a very normal technology, an entirely new perspective and approach to the management of sleep disorder breathing. What we're looking to do here is make a physiological change that is sustainable for a longer period than just the therapeutic time. We want to start reversing the physiology rather than just treating the anatomy. There is no nighttime variable with this device. And I think that is very important for the end user, especially when it's a snoring uh, problem for these individuals. It's a one size fits all. So this malleable mouthpiece will fit all tongue sizes. And we validated that through our maxillofacial department who have uh, actually assisted us in making this device. Uh, as it is, and uh, but also undertaken the validation studies for us in over 50 patients with different uh, anatomical sizes. I think that the treatment uh, is a very low burden of treatment for the patient. It is 20 minutes once a day for a six week period to get your desired effect. Uh, and I think that really is a low burden and a very low side effect profile related to it. All the side effects occur during the use and stop after the use, which is really quite good. I think I've shown that there is a high level of efficacy in the management of mild OSA and snoring. I think I've also shared with you some mechanistic data which shows and backs up the efficacy and the change that we're showing. So with that, I think having presented the concept, I would really be quite interested in the Q&A session. Okay, so before we, that, thank you very much, Dr. Sama, it was wonderful. Before we get into the QA, uh, there's two housekeeping things. Uh, before, before I get into that, though, I just want to point out to the attendees, it's uh, 1.50. This is supposed to go to 2. Of course, we'll stay for as long as people are asking questions. Uh, but for those of you that have another commitment to go to, I need to be respectful of that. So if you sign out at 2 uh, and answer the questions at the end, make sure I have your um, uh, license numbers as, as needed, then you will get your CE certificate. So you're not obligated to stick around uh, to the end of the Q&A out of respect. And uh, so the first question to you, Dr. Sam, is do you want me to launch that second question, uh, poll question uh, yes. at, at this point? Okay, so let's, uh, it, it should be launched now. In the COVID-19 era, what is acceptable to prescribe for snoring and mild obstructive sleep apnea to minimize infection? Um, so it should be officially launched now, and we'll give a minute or so for people to uh, vote. So voting is going to close in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and share the results there. So I'll, I'll read it off to you, Dr. Sama. Uh, so sure. 38%, oral appliance therapy 30%, 
CPAP 5%, and there is no acceptable COVID era sleep therapy, uh, 28%. Okay. So, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, so you may want to speak to that um, before we do the Q&A, but even before both of those things, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite um, Cami Osborne to turn her mic on and just tell the attendees what they need to do in order to perhaps win one of these devices to be able to try out themselves at home. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Cami Osborne here. Thank you, uh, John and Professor Sama. It's always such a pleasure to learn from both of you. Um, so just to explain, we're running a fun social media event. Uh, so uh, to give away a free Snoozeal device and the person with the most accumulated points will win and points are given for your likes, follows, tagging your friends and lastly for hashtagging Snoozeal and Signifier Medical Technologies will directly message the winner to collect your shipping information and with shipping, we hope that it won't be too delayed given the current circumstances, but we will do our best to get it out to you as soon as possible. And the contest will run for the next 24 hours, starting from right now. So have some fun with it and good luck. Okay, um, uh, thank you. Now, one final thing also, in the download section, the attendees can download a flyer that has information about the Suzeal device, where to get it, and also uh, a little discount um, code uh, to be able to pick one up for your office to trial out. Now, it's available, we need to mention this, I think, uh, uh, Kenny, it's available where it's allowed to be available right now. So it does not have FDA clearance yet, that's gonna be coming up uh, in the next few months, but it is available in Canada, is that correct? Please correct me if I'm wrong. In, yes. Indeed, yeah, it'll be available in the UK, in the EU countries that we're able to ship to Canada and Australia as well. Right, okay. So it's just the, the US right now, wherever FDA is, that's pending uh, the, the clearance. Exactly. Okay, great. Now it's, it's up uh, all yours, Dr. Sama and Elaine. If, uh, first of all, let Dr. Sama respond to this poll. So Zeal, 38%, oral appliance therapy, 30%. CPAP 5% and uh, um, there is no acceptable COVID era sleep therapy 28%. If you want to speak to that first and then, then Elaine can read you off some questions that we've got. Yeah, I'll be very brief on this because I'm keen to hear people's questions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's no right and wrong answer this is. This was really to look at what people's attitude is to COVID and how that will affect how we manage. We know that the guidelines currently are that CPAP can be a problem because you are, have a non-filtered system that's going to be increase the risk of infection. And going forward, that is going to be something that we have to consider in the future. Uh, but I think it was just, uh, it was a question just to uh, appreciate people's attitudes to COVID uh, and management in this area, rather than a right and wrong answer. Okay. Yeah. Elaine, are there any interesting questions that we can uh, oh, look yeah, at? We have, we have a few, yes. Um, okay, so first of all, we have to, uh, uh, <laughs> the first uh, uh, question that we had, or, or the first comment that we had is uh, from Dr. Barry Glassman uh, regarding the first poll, that uh, his comment is, it's not a good question, and the answer is none of the above. Do you want to make Fair enough. I thoughts think on that? The question is not meant to uh, as an academic test. It's really the questions are aimed to under, to get a grasp of people's understanding of the the problem and how they perceive the issue. So uh, I appreciate what they say, what he's saying, but it's interesting that people do recognise the role of the tongue is quite important in the management uh, and a causation of sleep disorder breathing. Great, thank you. Uh, the next we have Robert Brigida. Um, his question is, did people complain about biting their tongue? So the key thing is you're using the device during daytime. So you're in totally in control of it. You're awake, there is no actual uh, function. Also remember that the device actually sits between the teeth. So the, the projection that comes out of the mouth sits between the teeth. So it splints the teeth. Uh, whilst the tongue is contracting. So your back teeth are not contracted down so mm -hmm. to allow your tongue. So you, can't, you won't bite your tongue during the process. Great. Thank you. 
the next one is uh, Maher Naji. My wife, he, the question is, my wife has mild OSA. I have made for her sleep apnea device to advance, to advance her mandible, but her compliance was not good. Uh, can I have a sample of this Nusol device to try it on her, and then I can recommend it to my patients? I heard Naji DTS. I think there's nothing like personal experience to to actually validate what you have, and I think John, you've got some experience with the device. Uh, I've, uh, I just finished uh, treatment 21 last night, so it's been three weeks. I've been using it. It's very comfortable. Um, all of those little side effects that you mentioned there. I mean, if it happens to be touching a large filling, I can feel a little tingle. I just reposition it. Um, the salivation thing happened at first when I was in you know, the first week or so, and then it got better, better, better. Now it's hardly a noticeable issue. Um, and really, I mean, I just go on with my day. I put it on, I watch the news or I read an article or something, next thing I know, it's probably the treatment is finished before I'm finished doing what I'm doing. So I hardly even notice, you know, it's, it's very simple. And um, I, I'm very encouraged, and I, I wear an appliance and have for 20 years. And so I know uh, my appliance is sort of maxed out as to what it does for me. So I'm, I'm hoping to actually experience, you know, a, a, a benefit, you know, to up the game for whatever my appliance was doing for me, right? So, so that's just my personal uh, experience with it. Very limited to the last three weeks. So I think that kind of answers a lot of the question just raised in that, we see this as a combination therapy. Uh, there is no reason why you can't use a mandible advancement device with CPAP, and there's no reason why you cannot use a Snoozeal with uh, a mandible advancement device. Uh, so the Aditi Desai, who's one of our colleagues in London, who's the president of the British uh, Dental Sleep Association Academy, her philosophy to this is that she gives them both to the individual. With the view that as the CPAP, uh, as the Snoozeal device kicks in, the compliance can be varied to be able to accommodate that. So it actually is complementary and both work in a slightly different way. One works anatomically, the other works physiologically, and are both affecting and helping the same way. Compliance is very easy with the device. Uh, we know that in at least in our trial patients, it's 80% plus. And we're now monitoring the compliance on also individuals who are using it who are happy for us to monitor it so that we know what it is like in the, in the market there. Uh, but with 80% compliance, we're getting the effect that we're getting. Uh, that, so I think compliance shouldn't be a major issue with this because it's only 20 minutes through the daytime. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. So. Um, then we have a question from Martin Basur. Uh, is this product sold over the counter? So at present, uh, different geographies are slightly different. So the plan would be when we get IFDA later this year, it's going to be a prescription item. But in U EU, it is uh, validated as over the counter product. Uh, we do, however, prefer to have clinicians involved in the management of these things because if you're treating patients with mild obstructive sleep apnea, we're very keen for clinicians who deal with the problem actually prescribing it and we're quite happy for us if you wish to prescribe the product we can uh, as i mentioned there's a discounted rate because we're very keen to be certain that this product's not being used just hither thither for somebody who is not appropriate for it so we would prefer it to be advocated by a sleep physician uh, or, a, or a dental physician who's involved in this management uh, then actually be just over the counter, though it is available over the counter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we have is from Mohammed Al Haddad. Was the physical characteristics of this group or a variety of types? So the BMI goes between uh, below 35. Age group is anything above 18. So in the 100 database, there are patients that I showed you. The age group was 18 and above, uh, with an average age comes around 50, I believe. Uh, and the proportionality of male to female was, uh, I think, three to one or two, to something along those lines. So there were quite a significant proportion of females in the group as well. 
And those are individuals, interestingly, who seem to get quite a significant benefit with this device. Uh, because we know around peri perimenopausal stage, muscle physiology in women change because the hormonal change. And with it, there is a significant increase in sleep disorder breathing in, in these individuals. And it seems to be able to address that problem. Wow. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is uh, from, again, Martin. Uh, this question is, how does this product improve the malampati criteria? So we looked at the malampati of the Friedman criteria, and there is no correlation between the malampati of the Friedman criteria, which is one to four, uh, and the outcome. So we took everybody from uh, Friedman from one or malampati one to four, and there was no correlation that people who had malampati four were less likely to respond than people who had Mount Party 1. Uh, so it appears that actually the size of the tongue is not that important as we assess it with the Mount Party or Friedman criteria. Uh, mm -hmm. It appears the physiology is, diff is the change. Great. Now the next question is from Iofi Stack in um, you partially answered, well, you answered this question, is this going to be available to patients directly? Um, you answer that, uh, you would prefer not to, but there's also, what are the lab fees? So the lab fees is zero because it's a one size fits all. Uh, but the key aspect, as I mentioned previously, that it's very important for appropriate clinicians to be involved in the management of this condition. So mm -hmm. it is the reason we can sell this product to the country, it's off the shelf because the mouthpiece is a universal mouthpiece. Uh, mm -hmm. So the product doesn't have a lab work associated with it, but it does. it is valuable for it to have direction by appropriate clinician. Thank you. The next so I, th I, think, I think, sorry, Elaine, I think, I think they were referring to the actual cost of the device, perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, uh, I know it's on your website there, but is that something that, uh, if somebody's wondering what the cost of the device of the clinician is. The, the cost is on the website and the different geographies, the cost structure is slightly different, as you would right. expect, sure, with sure. the distributors that we have. So, okay. uh, but if, you, if you're interested in the cost, uh, just contact the info, uh, uh, sure. the information on the website and they will be able to advise you. Sure. Perfect, thank you. Since observed effects wane after a period of time, how many repetitions per year would you need to, to sustain the effects over time? This is from Jim Rodriguez. A very, very good question, uh, because at the end of the day, it's only any therapy needs sustainability over time and efficacy, not three months, six months. We're really looking at a year, two years down the line. So I shared a little bit of data there, which looked at three months and six months results. Those we're now going to take over to a year. Uh, we recommend that you use the device if you have simply primary snoring once a week after your six week therapeutic period. And if you have mild obstructive sleep apnea, twice a week after the six week therapeutic period. Our data to date supports that if you maintain that, you actually maintain the effect of the six-week therapy period that you had. Uh, but we're going to continue monitoring it for up to a year, and we'll be able to update you a little bit more. But that's a very valid and important question. Thank you, Joe. Um, the next one is from Barry Glassman. Not especially related, but do you know how well the reported snoring compared to actual snoring in the PSG? So, the PSG that we undertook did not specifically have a snoring channel in it because they were doing EMG studies at the same time. So that data will be shared with you, which is because this is preliminary data, uh, Dr. Professor Malotra is actually analyzing the EMG data. So we're going to provide additional data looking at EMG. So it's electrode-based EMG assessments of their tongue during sleep, pre-therapy, and during the PSG after therapy to show the change in EMG. Uh, so we don't have the snoring data on the PSG, unfortunately. But what mm -hmm. we do have is the snoring data on 100 patients 
measured at a set distance, so it's measured at the chest, so it's consistently the same position with the airway of the source, so it's, and it's been validated as a channel for recording of snoring. So the next is a common question uh, from Kandri Galil. And I believe that this person has left, but uh, hello, nice presentation. We treat sleep apnea, not mild cases by max, max mandibular ad advancement here at University of uh, Western. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think the two aspects, whoops, sorry. The two aspects related to this. One is, um, yes, this is for mild obstructive sleep apnea, and the threshold for therapy varies in different geographies. It's a different threshold in Australia as it in the US as it may be in, in Canada. But the key thing is that the problem is a spectrum. It starts with snoring, mild obstructive sleep apnea, and likely to progress. What we're also now doing is coming up with different generation products that are going to be treating moderate to severe as well. And that's the data which we're going to be generating next level up. So essentially, for something like this, this new technology, it's important to prove its efficacy at a lower level first and then build on that foundation to see what its efficacy is going to be at the more challenging end of moderate to severe sleep apnea. So data is going to be coming forward within the next year because we're doing trials on moderate to severe sleep apnea patients and we'll be able to share it. And hopefully then it can be an active part of your practice as well. Um, just for the record, this is from uh, Kandri Galil. Uh, just for the record of our 780 cases, <clears throat> we did surgically, we have success in 79. The uh, one of failure was due to return to ob obesity. So they had success in 79 out of 780 patients, was it? Or did I misinterpret that? Just for the record of our 780 cases we did surgically, we have success in, seven, in 79 it must be 79 percent. Yeah, I'm yeah. not really sure. Yeah, probably. And the fail, I guess, their rate of failure was uh, due to return to obesity. Okay. So, so the comment is that uh, failure of surgical outcomes is more likely to be co is, in his opinion, correlated with weight gain rather than weight. anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think if you look at the data, surgical outcomes. It depends on how long you monitor them. So if you monitor them for three to six months uh, versus if you monitor them for two to five years, you find that the surgical outcomes are slightly different. Uh, there is no doubt, like CPAP, if you anatomically make the airway bigger, you're less likely to get obstructive events. But mm -hmm. what we are missing in that whole concept, which is what we're trying to bring to the therapy or of these people, is the physiological component that's not really being addressed. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that surgery doesn't work, but I think this works entirely differently. Okay, and the next one is from uh, Don Ducasse. Uh What do you know about the effects of laser therapy for tightening the palate? For tightening the palate? So there's been a lot of work on that and there's a lot of literature on it as well. It's not very often used in Europe, but has a much higher utilization in Japan and also in US as a rule. So some of the concepts of where I came to came from these therapy options. What was very interesting to me as a surgeon is that you have people who are using radio frequency, you have people who are using monopolar, you have people who are using surgical manipulation of the palate, and they all seem to declare a very similar outcome in the early stages. What concerned me in that these individuals, some of these results tend to trail off after six months to a year. I'm not saying all of them, but some of them do. And that made me realize that some of the early results are likely to be because of the change in physiology due to our surgical intervention. Now, it is quite possible, but by operating and changing the neural 
input from the pharynx, because of our surgery and the healing, the scarring, you've changed the physiology. You've changed the muscle tone in that area. And this is not uncommon because we use this kind of technology of stimulating for other indices such as facial pain syndromes and other pain syndromes where surface stimulation changes how the, the neural effect is. So uh, personally, I've uh, used it. I don't use laser itself. I used to use radio frequency and I've used implants. Uh, but now I've moved more to more. If you're going to perform surgical interventions, you have to be do really manipulate the palate in a different anatomical position to be able to get a long-term desired effect, in my opinion. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and from Vipe, uh, Vipan Maini, uh, again, I think that this has been addressed. Does it, ha does it have to be dispensed by a dentist? It can be, uh, dis uh, it doesn't have to be, but it can be. Uh, so a dentist or a clinician or a, a, uh, any, any physician or a doctor can prescribe it, but it can also be prescribed over the counter. Thank you. And Donna Cassie has... <laughs> can, can, we, can we get John a razor, please? <laughs> this is my Corona beard challenge. So the challenge went out. I'm going to put this out there to the whole world. The challenge went out to all the, the dental sleep medicine CE providers in North America, and I'm the only one growing a beard. That's how influential I am. I'm just yes. going to put that out there. <laughs> okay. I, so, <laughs> I grew one, but it was too white, John. So I, I just <laughs> Because this device specifically targets the role of the tongue in the upper airway narrowing collapse. Did you look at whether any of this patient's um, sleep apnea or snoring was more positional related and whether the uh, pre versus post supine AHI differ significantly, significantly? This is from Stephanie Smith. Yes, no, no, very valid and very good question in that uh, we know that sleep apnea has a significant positional component. So one of the things we did look at is in our pre and post therapy uh, sleep studies was it this a result purely the fact that the patient was less likely to be in the supine position the post therapy period so actually it was the converse that we found that the percentage of time on the supine position in the post therapy sleep studies was higher than the percentage time in supine in the pre therapy period so we're comfortable that the supine position is not affecting it. There are sub-analyses that we need to really look at is the AHI in positional basis and REM sleep basis. And that needs a lot of interpretation as well. So that data I'll be sharing with you in the near future because we're going to work collaboratively with Athol in looking at these aspects of REM and, and positional impact on the AHI in this mild OSA group, but a very valid question. We're confident that it is not positional based, the result we've gone, because I know that the patients were in a greater proportion of time in the supine, in the post-therapy sleep studies. Thank you. Then we have uh, from Caddy Galil again, the, uh, he has a correction, the uh, correction. We only did 80 cases, success is 79. Oh. Okay, <clears throat> that's an extremely high success rate, I must confess. Uh, yes. It, uh, well, I think one of the key factors in surgery is patient selection. Uh, you know, if you just take every patient and you give them a surgical outcome, a uh, surgical intervention, it is unlikely to give you such high surgical success rates. So you need, you probably had a very select process to achieve these results. Uh, because there's no one therapeutic modality that will treat all the complex spectrum uh, of, of physiological and uh, morphological changes that occur that make up this entity of sleep disorder breathing. So I think your selection process was very good. And I presume it was uh, something like maxillar mandibular advancement because most to really get a sustainable change at that high level, you need to be moving both the maxilla and mandible forward. But I, I'm not sure what kind of uh, surgical intervention he's talking about. Good job, Cadigula. Um, 
Doug Tree, did you want to add something? I was going to say, it sounds like a tricky ostomy. It's so high, that success rate. But anyway, but that's... <laughs> That was a joke. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's Haley. Uh, from Kit, what? Any money back guarantee on this product? No, because at the end of the day, we we don't claim and we don't guarantee we're going to cure your snoring and mild or say. We know that it works uh, a change in 80, 80%, but only about 70% there is a 50% reduction. So uh, we don't really offer a money back guarantee as such, uh, but I think the key factor really is that if if you've been appropriately assessed by sleep study or by a physician to be certain that you are in the right category, then you should get some change. And the next one uh, we have addressed is from Maher Naji. What is the co cost of the device? You address that. It's on the web website. Yeah. And uh, what is the warranty? Where can I get more educational training videos on this product? Okay. So they're available on the website. Uh, if you want some, there are some videos on the website, including how to use the product and also testimonials from individuals. So the website does have educational material for you. The warranty. Sorry. Sorry, it's displayed on the screen. Uh, on the screen. Okay, perfect. So you can screenshot it, I guess. Uh, yeah. And it's also on the download. Um, if somebody downloads the document and the handouts, uh, the, the information, the website's also there. You make the announcement, right? You can download it, you can print it right yeah. from the seminar. Uh, the it, warranty is that it's uh, it, it has no serviceable um, characteristics. The, the product uh, this, the, uh, will have a three-year life, and the mouthpiece has to be changed every three to four, three months, because if you have constant use with something in your oral cavity, you will have some degree of degeneration from the saliva and interaction with oral uh, um, bacteria, and we want you to be uh, changing it every three months so that you have an appropriate device in your mouth. And that, this is something for me. How, how do you clean it? How do you sanitize it? You don't need to sanitize it. You don't need to any any alcohol-based products. You simply clean it with tap water. That's uh, it. You don't that's use it. any products on this. Yeah, you don't need any specific product for cleaning. Uh, so silicone-based tap water. So, so can you use uh, the regular dish soap um, uh, on it, uh, which well, we, is what we, what we use with oral appliance sometimes. You can just just uh, basically disinfect it to the point of uh, of 99.9 percent. .9%, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Piece of mind. absolutely. I, I, it's not contradictory, but our recommendation is simple tap water because we've used that uh, on on patients and we've re-examined the mouthpieces to look at the state of the mouthpiece uh, mm -hmm. to be certain. We've also actually had 50 of our trial patients have a dental assessment before therapy and then mm -hmm. repeat the dental assessment after therapy to look at is there any change in the oral status uh, buckle status, uh, are we doing any detrimental effect on the oral hygiene? Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that hasn't documented any change at all. Uh, so, yes, you can. Uh, we would recommend simply tap water is what's required. Uh, remember, most of the oral devices are often used for four to six hours as such. Our device mm -hmm. is only being put in the oral cavity for 20 minutes, and it's mm -hmm. suspended around the tongue. So mm -hmm. the degree of, of involvement is reduced do you find that your patients have to, who have been using it tend to actually put them in um the the if they have an oral appliance to try to use whatever they're using on their oral appliance well we in the trial we've had nobody on combination therapy uh, because mm -hmm. we were looking at pure mild sleep apnea snoring patients without uh, other so none of them actually had uh, oral devices at the same time okay. uh, but and we're going to do we are doing some work on the oral devices uh, as a combination therapy. But uh, so I cannot speak from experience of what these patients uh, were doing about, and we haven't interrogated them to identify what they have done with the product. 
but each of the product was assessed at the end of the six weeks time to ensure the electrical current uh, functionality was fine, visually assessed so that we could look at whether there was any degeneration in the product with the constant use over six weeks. Certainly yes. comfortable the product uh, is, is usable for three months. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> How long does the battery last? This is from Alina Grisep. So it's a rechargeable control unit. It'll give you five to six therapies each charge. So you have to change it, you know, charge it every three days. Perfect. Uh, from Kadri Galo, my station, we here in Canada, up Western, we do maxi, maxi, maxillomandibular advancement and we successful in the 80 cases. We did 79 were favorable, favorable and successful and the 80, number 80 was surgically successful, but the patient decided to get fat. So I guess this is a clarification. <laughs> you can't control your patients, I'm afraid. <laughs> so it was oh, making the facial advancements that you're talking about. <laughs> but that's a fairly well-selected group of patients, and it's a fairly aggressive surgical intervention. It's not really an option for the average pro person with this problem. And we know that weight has a significant impact, and the selection criteria does involve uh, appropriate patients' weight. So yes, I, I commend you on your high success rate, uh, but I think our solution is really aimed for a different category of people. Good job, Kadri. I don't know if you if you heard me last time. Good job. Um, well done. Uh, the next one is from Rui de Sousa. Are there titration effects, whether in duration of use per day, length, or treatment in weeks, or in voltage? If this was uh, answer, I apologize. My attention is divided at work. No, not no. Very valid, very valid no, question. I haven't covered that in my presentation. So the reason we decided on a six-week therapy is because we have monitored the temporal change in these individuals, week one, week two, week three, to week six. And what we know is that people respond at different rates. Some people respond within the first two weeks and achieve plateau uh, at the end of the two weeks. Others need four weeks and a little bit longer to achieve that plateau. So the six-week therapy time was based to make sure that we offer an adequate, adequate therapeutic period for these individuals to be able to achieve the maximal outcome. But there is a variation between them. Now, some of the sleep apnea trials that we're doing, we're looking at twice daily therapy as an option. And as you saw in the first trial that we did, proof of concept was a twice daily therapy. Uh, yes, we noticed that there is a slightly increased improvement with that, but we also know that when you have a, a, a patient, when you have the mild snoring, OS, uh, snoring and OS, mild OSA patients, compliance with twice daily for a busy, schedule can become difficult, even if it's a 20 minute thing. And that's one thing we learned from our first trial, that the compliance with twice daily was difficult, which is why we brought the therapy period down to once daily to make sure it had the same degree of effect. Uh, using it 10 times a day will not be advised. And in fact, the device will not let you use one consecutive after another consecutive therapy. It locks you out because what we do not want to do is people trying to abuse the device, thinking if I get my result in six weeks, if I actually shrink it to two weeks, I will get that benefit in two weeks. It doesn't happen. It's like going to the gym. It's not a question of, it's a repetition over four to six weeks that changes the physiology. It's not intensive eight hour workout in the gym that's suddenly going to make you a hunk overnight. Robert Kadas, legitimate question now. <clears throat> Was there an age-dependent relation? Sorry, was there an, an age-dependent relation as to the efficacy of the device? Uh, not in our data on the hundred odd patients. Um, what the only age-related correlation we got is patients who got more than fifty percent reduction in AHI had a, a age correlation with it. But with snoring and uh, other aspects of uh, of change there seemed to be no age correlation with it. A younger, younger got a better response? Uh, yes, as they, as they were younger, they got a better response. 
Okay, from uh, Lawrence Jones, Jones uh, did hypoglossal stimulation create any un unexpected symptoms in ears and in the ocular optic, optic reflex? From Laurie Jones. Mm -hmm. So the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, which is the implanted device, does have quite a high risk and a side effect profile associated with it. So if you look at their trials, uh, it is quite a high side effect profile related to it. But uh, there is no documentation that I'm, I'm aware of of earache associated with it uh, or other neurological sequelae because they are specifically stimulating the nerve at a distal component rather than the proximal end. And that is specifically because they want to actually affect the protrusional muscle group rather than the retracting muscle group which is supplied preferentially with the uh, the first few branches so uh not that i'm aware of but i have not haven't uh, implanted hypoglossal nerve stimulators in anybody so i may not be the appropriate person to be answering this thank you okay uh what this is from kadri again galil uh, one of our colleagues ent here uses tongue reduction wedge which what we don't like it we we treat these cases by maxillary mandibular and advancement but don't tell him okay <laughs> we won't tell him okay but well, if you you want the one, <laughs> this is gonna go up <laughs> so you, okay sorry <laughs> yeah well i think surgical intervention to tongue base it's fraught with complications and problems. Uh, uh, it's not an area to go uh, easy. I mean, I, I work in that area a lot. It's not a procedure that I would advocate or, or perform. Uh, so from Fran Walker, who qualifies to use, to use the snoozle? So at present, the regulatory and efficacy data is really oriented towards primary snoring and mild sleep apnea. Uh, we do not have uh, regulatory approval above that category. So below HR15 is what we would recommend. Until we can provide additional data on moderate to severe and then change our regulatory position. Hi, Paul. Paul Alter is here and he has a question. Is there any concern if, patient, if the patient has a pacemaker? Uh, pacemaker? Yes, we uh, pacemaker patients or any patients with implanted electrodes are, are, are contraindicated because this is a Bluetooth device uh, and you need a minimum of uh, I think 15 inches between the pacemaker and any other Bluetooth device. And with somebody using it in their mouth, uh, that's not achievable. So yes, it is a contraindication. So anybody with an implanted uh, electrode array or, or a pacemaker is a contraindication as is pregnancy. Okay, great. That's important. Good question. Oh, good job. Mm. And Kadri, Kadri Galil again, moderator. I'm sorry if you see my questions twice. Reason your presentation disconnects and we repeat the question. Thanks for understanding. No problem, Kadri. No, it's, it's no great problem. that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> From Paul. Uh, again, John, uh, in light of yesterday's discussion about patients who selectively forget about signing a paper acknowledging that by changes are possible, any thoughts on what to do when a tooth breaks or an only de debonds? We know the device will be plain. That's a great question, Paul. That's actually a really good question. So this is an oral appliance question, nothing to do with this Nazil. So we can discuss that next uh, next Wednesday. The bottom line is this. It's all about transparency and disclosure and uh, making sure the patient understands the risk of wearing an appliance and mm -hmm. having them sign that consent form. So mm -hmm. when something does go sideways uh, and the patient uh, you know, wants to sort of take it to another level, you know, mm -hmm. it's all being discussed and disclosed and acknowledged and consented to. And that's really the short answer to that question, Paul. But we can discuss it further at Dental Sleep Medicine and Speak Easy on Wednesday if you wish. Yeah. Thank you, though. Okay, so the next one's from Dan. Uh, would hypnotics or muscle relaxers affect efficacy of this new seal? 
So we know that muscle relaxants will affect sleep disorder breathing in general, and alcohol is one of the biggest commonly used muscle relaxants that affects this uh, condition. So absolutely, I think if you are on specific muscle relaxants that work on skeletal muscle, not smooth muscle, because you've got to remember tongue is a skeletal muscle, whereas most muscle relaxants that we use for GI-related disorders are smooth muscle related, uh, there's no overlap between the two. So uh, if it's anything that actually affects skeletal muscle physiology, but, such as alcohol, yes, it will obviously affect. So you know that even with a manual advancement device or CPAP, if you have a, a skin full, it doesn't matter what your device is, it, you, you are going to struggle with your sleep quality that night. Um, mm -hmm. So, But other generic ones that are used for GI will not have an overlap because they work on smooth muscle and with dealing with the skeletal muscle. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so Kadri, <laughs> another comment from Kadri. Again, fantastic presentation. Thank you for it. And I am with you if you can treat it conservatively. More power to you. May I will recommend it to mild cases. Thank you, Kadri. Very kind, Kadri. It was nice having communication with you. Uh, yeah. And really appreciate your active input and involvement. Yeah. That really yeah. makes this whole thing dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, it's been acknowledged on this and other webinars how nobody has the magic bullet. It's a whole bunch of different tools, and this is just another tool in our armamentarium, and which is what got me very excited about it, especially after I heard Dr. Simon present it several, a few weeks ago and realized that there was science behind this. And then, well, this is another tool that we could use that we have available to us. And that's what's exciting for me. Not that it's the magic bullet, just like CPAP is not the magic bullet, just like an oral appliance alone is not the magic bullet. Exactly. Uh, Kit Huan says that he, will like the doctor training video and where can uh, can they uh, get them yeah so the the training video is is so the whole k pathway in different places is slightly different so what we do do is create packages to assist and help clinicians in say in australia and uk versus canada the pathway is different and hence the package will be slightly different so what we can do is if you contact our information uh, office, we will send you an appropriate package to help you with the management of this condition in your geography. Thank you. Um, from Colleen Nagel, uh, cochlear implants, are they contraindicated? The titanium implants? No, they're not. So originally when we started with the product, we had that as a contraindication. But when we did the dental assessments before and after for the 50 patients, uh, about, uh, I think about 10 or 12 of those had dental implants. Uh, and we monitored very carefully what happened to those implants with the therapy that we're doing. And uh, there was no change, as there was no change with any amalgam or caps uh, related to this. So we're quite comfortable to say it's safe to use with dental implants. So, uh, thank you. So, Dan Tashi just has a, a comment that Barry Glassman is actually a very nice man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree totally. <laughs> we agree. Yeah, we love Barry. We do. <laughs> One more question from Kadri Galil. One more question, please. What is the age range? Uh, how old and young are your patients? Our patient, the youngest was 16, the oldest 80. Yes, 80 years old. No comorbidity, of course. Uh, so our age range in the different trials is slightly different, but with the big trial with 100 plus patients, age range was 18 and above. And we had individuals to the age of 78 in the, at the top end, and the lower end was in the 20. Uh, so we had nobody who was between uh, you know, 18 in our trial as such. But we know that it's effective in that age range. Uh, people have asked in the past, what about uh, you know 16 year olds or or, uh, or below 16 year old age group? Well, we we don't really currently have a regulatory approval for that, and I think the mouthpiece is is universal for an adult population, not for a, a child population. So at present, any age above 18 is is fine. Great, thank you. 
Uh, okay, so Vit uh, Angie Ham says, be careful, Barry is going to require evidence-based. We know. <laughs> we know. Uh, and also, thank you, the lecture and organize this beautiful, beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. That is very, very thank nice. You. Thank you. And from Stephen Gaines. Hi, Stephen. Uh, if the snow seal, if the snow seal is meant as a primary treatment device and no single treatment can work for all people, then a combination therapy would one treatment plan to use the snow seal first and then OTA, or should OTA be attempted to manage the problem first and then the snow seal? And if the OTA falls short of expectation, even after proper hydration. Very, very good question. Uh, how do you use it? Sorry. 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 And then he adds, and if John can comment as well on this. Perfect. Do you want to take the, it first, John? No, I'll let you. Okay. Um, so it's an, a modality of treatment that will work to a certain level. We know that it leads to the kind of changes that I've described. So the indications, it's a key thing for you is what are the primary drivers for the patient? And that is what uh, will affect. Uh, it's also, also a judgment that there is no one size fits all. Uh, so you can have a, a patient pathway that can say mandible advancement device first and then the, the snoozy if they have inadequate or you could have it the other way around. It's a question of what your patient's inclination is towards the therapy options that you're offering them. I see that you, in any consent process, should be offering them the therapy options, and the patient then decides what they feel is the most appropriate option of therapy for them. There is no doubt that it is likely that one will support the other, because one is anatomical and the other is physiological. So the probability is the two together are likely to give you much better results, but we haven't proven that with clinical trials, but the probability is considering what we're looking at and the evidence we're looking at. So I think it's patient choice. So I concur with everything we just heard, absolutely. And I, I really uh, am big on uh, disclosing uh, all of the options to patients. So before if somebody comes to my office, because my facility is uh, credited by the ADSM, I follow their protocols, which means I have to explain all of the alternatives. They're there to find out about an oral appliance. But here I am talking about MMA surgery. I am talking about uh, you know CPAP. And now I will be talking about the snoozle um, as an option, depending on what the category of apnea and, and what they're presenting as, right? And the patient is going to decide, uh, uh, ultimately, understanding the success rates associated with each, cost associated with each, and what would fit their lifestyle, um, they're going to decide. Uh, for, for somebody that approaches with just mild sleep apnea and snoring, very theoretically, a very simple case, Perhaps it might be all they needed. They don't have to wear something in their mouth all night long for the rest of their life. And and uh, perhaps put up with dental changes and everything that might, you know, bite changes that might happen. You know, I, I can't assure them it'll work, but I can show them or explain to them what the statistics are uh, based on the, the, the data that we have. And the patient can then make an informed decision as to whether they want to start off with a Sozeal or they'd rather have an appliance. Right, um, and so this is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. As I mentioned earlier, to me, it's another tool that you can use either potentially adjunctively, realizing this is brand new, so we don't have the data about the adjunctive outcomes. I've been using adjunctive therapies along with oral appliances for years to help improve my outcomes. Yet, it's only been in the last few years that all of these studies are coming out showing us, wow, if you use these two uh, therapies adjunctively, you get a better result. Like, really? Does it take <laughs> a study to show us that? You know, so, you know, the studies are nice and that's good, but, you know, you have different tools and you can use them alone or you can use them in combination depending on the patient, their preference, and their situation. And that's, it's about learning what all the tools are and how you can best apply them and then apply them in an informed environment with the patient. That's what I think. So Stephen Gaines says, 
by the way, Barry and John are rock stars. <laughs> I mean, they have groupies. <laughs> um, Paul Alter, I lost my audio for quite a while. Hopefully, this hasn't been asked. Have you tested what happens if you overuse it? It's all very well to it's all very well to have dentists involved, but invariable patients will acquire one. So uh, we have not done any trials on overuse, but we know that the people who have used it excessively through the day tend to get some side effects related to the tongue tingling and slight tongue discomfort because you have this repetitive action happening for 20 minutes. And then if you take a short break and then do it again and then do it again, then there is a exhaustion that occurs and there is a neural uh, hyperreactivity that occurs due to the sensory stimulation as well. So I think the side effect they're likely to get is tongue discomfort and fatigue related to this use. Uh, but we haven't done any formal trials on it. But I, would, I agree and understand what you say. And that is why we have programmed the device so that it cannot be reused immediately after finishing of a therapy. Otherwise, I can see that if this person has 60 minutes available today, I'm going to get my three therapies in today so that I don't have to worry about the next few days. That's now how it works. You just have to be patient and you've got to use it the way it says on the box. Great, thank you. Um, the next one is actually from Colleen Angel, actually. Uh, she meant uh, cochlear hearing aid implants. So it's a hearing aid implant, what she meant. Is it a so, so it's an implant. So unfortunately, it's likely to be a, uh, a contraindication. So there are two different types of ear implants. You have what's called bone anchored ear implants, mm -hmm. which are basically a screw system that goes onto the back for people who have conductive hearing loss. Those are not a contraindication because that's just a metal screw uh, and has no central connectivity. It's just transmitting sound from the bone to the opposite cochlea. Uh, so, but where you have a cochlear implant, whereby electrode has been put into your cochlea to the ear, because it's in the same region and it's an implant, we would suggest it's a contraindication. Perfect. Thank you. From Fred Walker, if my patient is already using a CPAP machine and wants to try this out, does he need to stop using the CPAP machine to see if Snoozeal would work? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, I think if it's in a supervised position, because you know that this is device is not indicated for moderate to severe sleep apnea, the patient is getting the primary therapy option of Snoozeal, uh, of uh, uh, CPAP, which is the important uh, classifier. If you want to supplement and try and help the patient with their compliance, then you can use Snoozeal, provided you, but it'll be what, it's your judgment for that patient at that point. Uh, it is not recommended from us as a company that you can use it for moderate to severe. What we anticipate with this is that it'll help to reduce the pressures. And we're doing some studies to look at auto CPAP patients who are on auto CPAP and seeing how the device changes their pressures. We definitely would not recommend the patient stops using CPAP because they're their primary therapy option and they should continue with that. But like using a nasal spray to augment the nasal airway, you can use New Zeal to augment the oral airway to try and improve their compliance with the CPAP therapy. That is an option. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, and then Kadri again, because there was a disconnect again, I want to thank Dr. Shama for a magnificent presentation. And as I said before, if I get a mild case, I, rec I will recommend this device when it's allowed in Canada. Thanks again. It's allowed in Canada now. From Paul Alter, I would have thought the tongue would get tired and fall backward? Uh, not particularly. So it's the intrinsic and some of the extrinsic muscles that you're trying to uh, attract. So it's a genoglossus, which is a key muscle that you're trying to get to, but you're likely to be going from the intrinsic muscles to those extrinsic muscles as well. So they are different 
functionality. The tongue has protrusion and retroposition because the retroposition is very important for swallowing process and other physiological things that we do with our tongue, whereas the protrusion is very important for keeping the airway open for, for us. So there is no fatiguing with 20 minutes therapy. I think our concern was if somebody wants to do three to five sessions in a day, then I think, yes, you will have some uh, adverse uh, physiological effect from that. But with 20 minutes once a day, it does not have that effect. Guess what? That's it. No more ah, comments or questions. We've uh, reached the end. I managed to stretch uh, this quite a bit. Almost an hour of questions. So that's fantastic. Yeah. That, uh, that is really yeah. very, very, it's a tremendous amount of interest in what you presented. And, and um, it's very engaging. It's a very interesting very uh, technology. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Sama, for spending this time with us. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you, uh, Kami for jumping on earlier. I uh, would like to just remind you folks that we have a, another webinar next Thursday with Dr. Elaine Chen and then the following week with Jeff Weiscarver. So um, please watch for that on uh, social media and in your emails. And uh, is there any last words you want to leave with us, Dr. Sama? Well, I'd like to really thank you, John, for having this forum. Very successful education platform. I'm delighted to be part of it. Delighted to be able to share my concepts with with you guys, and I'm enthused by the number of questions we got. Elaine and John, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Uh, and hopefully, we would meet again, maybe in a better time frame, and maybe face to face. Uh, uh, and uh, look forward to that. Thank you very and much. Meanwhile, oh everyone, stay safe. Cheers, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank the you, best. Dr. Sam. Good night to you. I know it's uh, late for you, probably. Uh, not too late. Um, yeah. Not too late. So good night, and thank, thank you, you, John. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you Take next care. week. Bye.